day, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for our special online event today, Upskilling Us All, Digital Skills for Digital World, which is part of the ITU Digital World 2021 uh, ongoing session, which has been running since, uh, since September on a weekly basis. My name is Paul Keneally, and I'll be your moderator for the day. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel, which brings together political, policy, private sector, and entrepreneurial leadership and talent from around the globe. Today, we're honored to be joined by Her Excellency, Ms. Ursula Ekufu Uwusu, the Minister of ICT from Ghana. Minister Okufu is a lawyer by training, serving as Ghana's Minister for Communications and Digitalization. She has an incredible background in championing the most marginalized in society, and she is also a serving member of the ITU Broadband Commission. Dorothy Gordon joins us as the Chair for Information for All program with UNESCO. Dorothy will also provide the opening keynote remarks. And she is a well-known global leader in the field of technology and development with a special focus on digital transformation in emerging economies. We're delighted also to be joined by Naria K. Santa Lucia, who's the General Manager for Digital Inclusion and Community Engagement with Microsoft Philanthropies, where her goal is increasing digital com computing and AI skills for traditionally underrepresented and under-resourced communities. Alfie Hamid joins us from South Africa, where he is the head of corporate affairs and global partnerships for Cisco. Alfie trained as a teacher and remains dedicated to empowering communities in their pursuit of and access to knowledge. And through his skills for all work at Cisco and his central role in promoting the impact of the digital transformation centers. Christopher Patno, is Head of Accessibility and Disability Inclusion for Google in the EMEA region, and he leads Google's efforts around the accessibility of product, people, and partnerships. Valerie Waspa is the founder of She Goes Digital. She joins us from Kenya, where she's also the Regional Digital Youth Envoy at Generation Connect. Valerie is a lawyer by training and deeply involved with several civil society organizations and movements that seek to empower young women and girls. And last but not least, from beautiful San Lucia, we have Shergan Rosary, the founder of Orbtronics and also a member of Generation Connect in the America's Youth Group. Shergan takes a vested interest in empowering youth in digital skills and has his own tech startup, which focuses on developing San Lucia's economy through STEM-based programs and initiatives. A wonderful, wonderful panel that we have convened here today. And just before we start with Dorothy's keynote, just a little bit about the session to put it into context. Since launching in September 2021, ITU Digital World has been running weekly virtual events, focusing on three important aspects of digital transformation infrastructure, policy, and accelerators. And it is this latter aspect of accelerators, specifically upskilling us all with the necessary digital skills to survive and thrive in a digital world that we are discussing here today with our excellent panel. We'll be exploring critical questions about how can we ensure that everybody everywhere is being equipped with digital skills? Who should be responsible for delivering and funding digital skills training? What underlying issues may be need to be resolved from infrastructure to content? Or what solutions, partnerships, or programs already exist that can inform and guide our roadmap to the digital future? It is a big, important, strategic, and critical and timely issue that we're discussing here today. So without further ado, to get us started, it is my pleasure to now hand the virtual floor to Dorothy Gordon, Chair of UNESCO's Information for All program for our opening keynote remarks. Dorothy, over to you. Thank you, Paul. And good afternoon, good morning, good day to everyone who is listening to us around the globe. And special greetings to my honorable minister um, in Ghana. Uh, rapid digitalization resulting from the COVID pandemic means that we're actually at an inflection point today. 
uh, when it comes to digital skills training. The digital skills gap is widening. And it's clear that if we were doing it right, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, I was just looking at a Salesforce um, statistic, which was looking at a cumulative um, impact on GDP growth in 14 of the G20 countries, and they estimated it at about 11.5 trillion. So the question for all of us is, how do we turn things around? Whether it's for the next billion who have to come online and who are already being forced to use e-government services that have been rolled out quickly as a result of the pandemic, or whether it's the university students that are being trained on obsolete technology or corporate employees in enterprises where training is the responsibility of line managers with no competencies or guidelines to assess training vendors. I think when I talk about digital skills training, it's fair to say that all of us have experienced it. We are all in a way, um, I don't want to say victims, but um, we've all experienced poorly designed digital skills training, uh, content that has not been relevant for us, we found boring and easy to forget because we had no direct use for it. And no one was actually tracking the impact of that training. So there is a lot of waste when it comes to digital skills training. And because I don't have much time, let me focus on what we could do to improve the situation. First of all, we need to create networks and working methodologies, feedback loops that allow potential employers to communicate the skill sets they need and how well they, the people they employ that have come through training fit those needs. In some countries, it's going to be very difficult to establish those public-private sector relationships. It's not that easy for them to get established. We need strong links with business and um, the public sector so that we understand and establish current and future needs. The, is one thing that some countries have adopted, and that is national competency frameworks, so that one can actually track skills with clear goals in mind. And that could help with the coordination and establish clear evaluation metrics as well. Those kind of frameworks <coughs> should actually include specially designed training that establishes non-traditional pathways into the tech industry. Universities need to be brought on board. Um, I've been shocked in discussing with university professors. I know my honorable minister is a lawyer and discussing with the law school as to how have, you know, what kind of upgrades to their content they've taken into account uh, to satisfy the needs of digital transformation. In geography, for example, geology, geography, land use management, we see that undergraduates have no exposure to geographical information systems. And the argument was, we can't afford the software for those numbers. And so we don't give it to anyone. And there are open source solutions that could allow these universities to roll out to the huge number of students that they have and make sure they are familiar with the software before they go into the workplace. We need to register training providers and focus on training of training programs that focus on quality content delivery and design so that a network of people exists who know how to, you know, who actually know how to train 
and we can look at audiovisual content and um, micro learning in local languages. But one of the most important things I believe is to make sure that the return on investment for trainers is very clear. Um, let me rush a bit because I see my time is ending. But um, one of the things that I think can help us is if we look at a different approach, uh, a more rapid response. And there's one um, approach that's been adopted that is right, rapid iterative testing and evaluation. So we need to develop that feedback, that set of feedback loops that will allow us to understand whether the training that we are delivering is actually having the intended impact and figure out how we can quickly change things if it's not. So it has to be iterative. We have a tendency to develop training content and it becomes static. That can't work. Um, let me just end by giving you a, a quick example. A few years ago, I was very happy to be a judge on a panel and we awarded a technology company or a technology a civil society actor, a not-for-profit in Chile, Laboratoria, an award. And why has Laboratoria been so successful? First of all, they focus on women. And I know my minister will support me. She's a wonderful champion for women. And they have developed their content specifically for the needs of the companies that will employ the products of the training. They do a six month boot camp, And at the end of it, 83% of the people who were trained are actually employed. And after some years, the evaluation is more than 90% of them have stayed within the sector. We have many great shining examples like these, but the fact is, that these are very complex problems. And if we're going to have the scale and impact that we, we are looking for, we really need to bring together people to think systematically about this and take it from being on the margins of our development agenda to being central to our development agenda. And I'm sure that the rest of the panel will show us the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy, for that inspiring um, opening keynote, which really frames the conversation perfectly for us. And you mentioned there also the, the impact of digital skills. And I'd like to come back to that question with you um, during the panel discussion, which I'm going to open now. And it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome again uh, Her Excellency Ms. Ursula Ekufal Uwusu, the Minister of ICT from Ghana. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us here today, Minister. Um, and I'd like to start by asking, um, we know that in Ghana you have led the launch of a, a new initiative called the Ghana Digital Economy policy. And it'd be really interesting for us to, to hear some more about this and particularly how it's going to benefit ordinary Ghanaians. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you um, in this series of, of interactions again. Um, you need policy direction for all the digital efforts that you are doing. And since 2017, we've rolled out significant initiatives to improve government citizen interaction and citizen to citizen engagement, um, increase transparency, um, make uh, government services more effective and efficient and reduce the avenues for corruption. However, we had been working with our ICT for Accelerated Development Policy, which was passed in 20, 2003. And that was long before many of the innovative solutions that we're currently working with were developed. And so we felt the need to update that policy to be in tune with current developments and to provide the proper policy framework 
for all the efforts that were, were undertaken. And so we've started implementing, we've started drafting and are in the process of developing our digital economy policy. Mindful of the fact that um, we can grow our economy through technology. We can formalize our economy through digital technology. And that is the way of the future. If we are to become re remain relevant in the fourth industrial revolution, which is currently unfolding. And so there is no disconnect between digitalization and economic development. And it, you were using digital tools to develop our, our, our economy. And so it is important that we look at the space and develop our digital economy policy. And so that's the reason why we're working actively at this, looking at the regulatory and, and legal framework, the technologies, the digital skills that are required, the actors in the sector, um, the infrastructure that is needed and, and affordability of that infrastructure, um, improvement, of, improvement of government efficiency through various e-governance tools, looking at how we can stay scale up um, our data acquisition, governance management, uh, uh, anal analytics, and utilize that data more effectively um, to feed into policy formulation and um, initiation and implementation. So it's a comprehensive effort that we're undertaking currently working with the private sector actors as well. And we're currently at the stage where we're going about to start uh, stakeholder consultations on it to get more feedback from those who are going to be using that policy. Government is an enabler and a driver of the uh, development of our digital economy, but we understand that we cannot go it alone and we need our private sector partners. And for me, just to add a little bit to what um, Dorothy just said, uh, providing our young people with the necessary digital skills that they need, it's not just fashionable, but it is a developmental and a security imperative. Because if we provide the young peoples of the African continent with the dig digital skills that they need today to enable them to thrive tomorrow, because of Africa's uh, demographic dividend, they stand the chance of being the human resource pool for running and manning the digital installations around the globe in view of the aging populations in Asia, Europe, and America. And if we don't want them to end up on the shores as um, illegal immigrants, it's imperative that we work to give them the tools that will enable them to thrive. So a key part of our digital economy policy is provision of digital skills for our young people to enable them to get a retain and attract the digital jobs that are being created daily. And, and that for me in a nutshell is why we're doing what we're doing. And um, we've just recently returned from uh, one of our girls in ICT initiatives um, in, in the Western part of the country. And one of the young girls had never seen a computer, saw that a mouse was actually a rodent. And she was throwing up when she was asked to use it to, to navigate um, the screen. But after a week of instruction in basic computer literacy coding, she was building her own website and actually presented for the group that was trained. And so if after just one week of instruction, she can create her own website and develop simple games. What can they not do, our young people not do, if they are giving in-depth instruction in the digital skills that they require to live life, then the life that is unfolding. So that is the task that is um, remains for us as policymakers working with the private sector to ensure that we deliver those tools to our young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. That was really fantastic overview. And it sounds like such a, an incredibly robust and, and flagship program that you have up and running. And I really, uh, you know, particularly like the, the statement and the emphasis that uh, there is no disconnect between digitalization and economic development. 
that digital skills are, are not a fashion, but a development and security imperative. And you also uh, emphasize a lot the need to collaborate and partner with the private sector. And in our panel today, we've, we have fantastic uh, representatives from different parts of the private sector. We have from, the, from machine manufacturing, from the technology and software, and from the internet side. And I'd like to go now to, um, to Southern Africa, to Alfie Hamid, um, who is head of global partnerships with Cisco. And Alfie, you're, you're a, a, a teacher by calling, if I may put it like that. You, you're a lifelong um, dedication to, to education and, and building of knowledge. And I'd love to know more about the work you're doing um, with through the digital transformation centers in particular and why these are important and what we, what we really need to learn from them and how we can, can support them more. Thanks for that. So, uh, firstly, greetings to uh, Her Excellency Minister Ursula and the High Dorothy and the rest of the panel. Um, yes, the Digital Transformation Centre. So, so let's look at this, right? We all know that knowledge is power. Knowledge is power is if you have that knowledge. And what together with knowledge comes literacy. So we're not only talking about literacy for books, we're talking about digital literacy. It's a whole new form of literacy altogether. If you can bring the two together, the child is going to be some, somewhat completely different from the old child in the classroom who was only looking at a book. Because if you look at a book, your knowledge is only limited by what appears in that book. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to achieve what many people have failed to do. Let's, let's put it this way. The rest of the globe has failed to do. For example, how many corporates think of going to Sao uh, Tome and Principe? It's a small country, but not many corporates would think of going there and empowering them with digital skills. This is what the Digital Transformation Center is about. It's about going to those sectors of the community who out of the ordinary, no one would even think that they would need to have digital skills. We, we, the Digital Transformation Center's targets the, that farmer who not even in his wireless team would say, you know what, I need to know what is the internet. I need to know what is social media. I need to know how to send an email. Or that housekeeper who says, doesn't even think that they need those skills, but the world is changing. If we look at what research has shown by McKinsey, for example, they said that the first, second, and the third industrial revolution has very much impacted on human labor on physical labor. But this fourth industrial revolution is gonna impact on both cognitive labor as well as physical labor. So if we want to make sure the people are employed, that their livelihood is not negatively impacted, we've got to make sure that we take these digital skills to everyone across the world. In addition to that, we look at, at any given time or every day, every day over 240,000 passwords are stolen. And that's that's amazing, right? That's just that number. Why? Because our people don't know how to be safe online. And this is what the digital transformation centers are going to do. Cisco and the ITU, we partnered together with, to say that there is this sector of the globe, there is this population of the globe, millions of them who have been left behind by others. How can we as Cisco and ITU get together to make sure we take them as well into this fourth industrial revolution. So this is what the program is all about. It's about not leaving anyone behind and taking the entire world into the fourth industrial revolution. And Alfie, you mentioned that, Alfie. Partic particularly underrepresented uh, se sectors of the community. So like, from what you're learning and from your experience, what are the digital skills that are most needed or that you would recommend everyone takes? You know, you talked about farmers, for instance, uh, people that wouldn't normally have these opportunities. I'd love to hear what, what, what are the sort of really the essential skills we should be, you know, catalyzing and speeding up. I think the most uh, critical skill now, like looking at what's happening globally, is basic cybersecurity skills. I mean, you know, to me, to me or you, to lose five dollars, maybe nothing. But to that farmer, for that farmer to lose five dollars that's been sent to them via mobile uh, banking means a lot. So we need to focus on basic cybersecurity skills for everyone. The next would be 
uh, being able to filter news, right? The, the challenge that we have at the moment is this whole, uh, where you get these false news that's going around, right? I think that's it's important for people to be taught how to verify the, the source of information that's coming to them. So I think those two, to me, would be the ones that we need to be focusing on, uh, in addition to obviously basic digital literacy skills. Yes, yeah, so these are these are really uh, real world um, needs that are that, that are coming in into the realm, particularly in terms of you know managing all of the information that's out there, being able to decipher what's what's true and useful and what maybe misinformation, for instance. Um, I'd like to return to to Ms. Dorothy Gordon, uh, who, who kicked off our keynote, and you, you emphasised a lot, Dorothy, um, obviously around the, the the importance of digital skills and tracking them. And we heard from Alfie there about all the work that's happening in digital transformation centres. So I'd like to ask you, um, you know, in your in your long experience and in, in your in your role as uh, in, in UNESCO right now, how do we realistically assess the impact of digital skills training on people's life opportunities? And I mean, added to that, if I may, how do we make sure that the content of digital skills is relevant to local people's needs? I think that's really a crucial issue that we need to get more uh, in depth on. Well, the way, um... First of all, let me say how much I agree with what the Honorable Minister has said, as well as Alfie. And what Alfie was focusing on is one of the areas that's very important for UNESCO, as well as um, the Information for All program, which I currently chair, which is an intergovernmental council. And that is media and information literacy training. And the way we've gone about it is to, first of all, build work on building a strong partnerships between the private sector, government, civil society, with clear goals, as I was saying in my introductory remark, so that we can track what is happening and then illustrating the best practice so that um, there's true knowledge sharing and um, people get on board. But let me say that there's a long way to go. Um, really, uh, training and metrics for assessing training have not been as well developed as they should. And this is something that we have to continue working on. We have to continue working on those evaluation frameworks and the feedback loops between the different partners so that we actually know that good things are happening. And I want each of us to think about the digital skills training that we've experienced and think about how that could have been improved if we had better metrics and feedback loops. Thanks. No, indeed, and uh, I think that could be a, a good call to action coming out of today's panel discussion to develop really uh, accurate ways and, and more sophisticated ways of tracking the impact of digital skills training. And indeed, in preparation for, for, for this session today, um, it struck me how little data there is out there on the impact of digital skills training. Um, if I may ask in a follow-up question, uh, Dorothy, um, uh, like it seems to me in terms of the proportionality of, of investment, in your experience, um, is it that some countries seem to receive more attention than others when it comes to donor funded digital skills training projects? And is that an issue we need to um, discuss more and, and, and be more aware of? First of all, let me say that I don't think that any country should be depending on donors when it comes to digital skills training. The impact of donor funding can never be to the level that we need in order to make a difference. So donors are important. They can help us to share best practice and knowledge, but every country has to actually put this at the center of their development agenda. That being said, um, I was very amused when one of my ITU friends mentioned donor darling. What, and um, my older brother, who um, is a zoologist, he calls it the safari effect. You'll see that certain countries where it's nice to visit, 
um, during certain seasons of the year, et cetera, tend to receive more attention than other countries. And as Alfie said rightly, small countries, vulnerable countries, um, uh, for example, we see that many of the Sahelian countries don't get enough attention because the situation there uh, in terms of security may be difficult, but if you're going to overcome those security problems, you must give the youth hope. There must be some way of assuring that they will get jobs so that they don't get lured into um, uh, some of these, uh, let's say, dangerous activities that result in that. So I would urge, I think that we should actually develop a map because it's always good to work with data. Let's get a map and let's see where donor activity is around this area. Let's also use the data to track the percentage of women that benefit from this donor activity, because I'm always shocked to find that some people are still not tracking this very important metric. And then, we need to look at other vulnerable groups, like people who are living with disability, because there's so much that can be done with digital training. So I do hope we get a more even involvement and that we shouldn't only go to those countries where it's easy to work. You know, like my own country, Ghana, is a donor darling because it's very easy to get things to happen in Ghana. But in a spirit of Pan-Africanism, let me urge that some of the countries where no one wants to seem to go must actually get more attention focused on them. Thank you. Very, very valid point. Um, I'd like to turn now to Naria Santa Lucia from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Philanthropies. Um, Naria, we've, we've heard a lot about the role of the private sector and it seems a very positive um, collaboration spirit around digital skills already exists, but um, in your view and in your experience from the private sector perspective, uh, what, if any, responsibility does the private sector have to digitally skill workers and, and future employees around the world, because I think we've seen particularly over the shared experience over the last two years, the absolute critical importance that digital connectivity and digital skills have for in terms of employment and collaboration and innovation. So it'd be really interesting to hear what you're learning um, from Microsoft uh, philanthropy's point of view and, and where, you, where, where your roadmap is heading in, in, in this respect. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the question. And I just want to say I've been sitting here just, you know, nodding vigorously to everything that's been said, because this is just a master class um, from Dorothy and from Her Excellency and from Alfie and all the amazing work that everyone's driving. So first, thanks. I'm just honored to be in this company and congrats on the digital transformation centers. I think it's just wonderful. And I, I just applaud how you go to the places um, that are furthest from opportunity for, for digital from Cisco. So congrats. Congratulations on that. Um, I think, you know, if I could just answer the, the question and, uh, by, by talking a little bit first about why upskilling and digital skilling does matter to Microsoft. And if you think about where kind of our mission, of course, where we start all of our work is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And um, in order to really get to that mission, we need to think about every single individual and how we can continue to provide them with the digital skills, skills and, and um, ability to continue to move forward in an equitable way. Um, a couple of things, as, as, as Dorothy, you were speaking about kind of the last two years and, and what has happened since then. Right at the beginning of COVID, our CEO, Satya Nadella, had said, that there was um, uh, two years of digital transformation that happened in just two months. And I think it has even accelerated from there. And at the early days, we did a calculation to say, if there was maximum digital transformation across industry sectors, what would happen? And, you know, would there be a growth in roles? And we actually calculated that there would be about 150 million new jobs, um, of course, based in like the cybersecurity, to Alfie, your point, the huge growth sector, IT, software developer. But more than that, I think now we've kind of marked 
the change in this different um, uh, point of maximum digital transformation where we will say now every job in some way is a tech enabled job. Every learning moment is a tech enabled learning moment. And so it is so critical. We have to get this right as a whole community because the gap will just increase and not only increase, but like transformation, accelerate. And so we need to really be very careful about that. And as the honorable minister said, I just love that story that you told about the young woman with the mouse and then was creating games at the end of the, the week. You know, we truly do believe like talent is everywhere and opportunity opportunity is not and how can we Microsoft help to get that opportunity as to as many places as possible. So to that point, you know, I think also with companies very much thinking about ESG in a different way, it's not just you know, what we are required to do. It's what we are, um, there is a moral imperative to do and really a business need to do. Um, and so the private sector has a huge role to play, but it's only in partnership. I think the theme of that I've been hearing all, all um, day here and during the session is it needs to be with the public sector. It needs to be with government, needs to be with NGOs and IGOs and agencies all together. Um, you know, private sector, we can innovate, we can fail quickly, we can think of, you know, kind of um, ideas. And then uh, we need the government to scale. And we also need NGOs that are trusted in communities to really go deep and in depth. Um, and I, I just, I'm taking these notes about, especially that feedback loop that Dorothy, you mentioned is so important. I, I want a plus 1000 on the sharing of data. Um, in the US, we just kicked off a new thing with a nonprofit uh, partner, um, a digital equity scorecard. And that looks at six different indicators to ask, you know, is there a framework in place for a state? Is there, are there dollars, public dollars flowing to digital skilling? You know, what is the state of the digital literacy of adults in that community? And it's e interesting to see where the different states are landing. Is there a way we can all share data to do that on a, uh, on a global scale? That I think could be really powerful and interesting if we can do that. I mean, I think we have the resources, you know, right now to 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 do it. So, you know, maybe that is another call to action for all of us together. And then the last thing I think the public private sector can really focus on here, um, you know, something that we ourselves are grappling with and trying to push ourselves to do more is go beyond just the skilling. The skilling is the low hanging fruit. Yes, many people still need to skill, but we need to connect people to the job and the opportunities. And we can't stop until we get to that last mile. That's incumbent on the private sector to think about hiring and to think about um, skills-based hiring and other ways to bring in talent. But it also um, is, you know, how can we create more solutions to create connect people around the world to those roles and to those jobs? So, you know, there's just so so much that we should be doing in the private sector. I think that we're, we are starting to do, and we just urge all of our uh, colleagues to do more, but then of course, do it in that mode of partnership. Great stuff, uh, Nuri. I really like as well the, the, the phrase, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. Um, can I ask before I go on to Chris from Google, can I ask you, um, like, are there some good innovative approaches that Microsoft is leveraging to provide people with digital skills that you'd like to tell us about? Absolutely. So in the um, in the uh, start of the COVID pandemic, we did launch an initiative to try to, our goal was to help 25 million people with skills for the COVID economy. Um, and that was at that moment where everybody was going dig digital. So what we tried to do is really take a holistic approach and to leverage um, our data from LinkedIn to think about what are the top growth areas and segments in that during that period? What are the skills that somebody needs in order to really um, gain one of those roles and opportunities? Um, are there certifications or certificates or signals that you need to um, signal the acquisition of the learning? And then finally, can we connect them back on LinkedIn to a job opportunity? And um, we, we put that out there as free learning content. Um, we've reached 48 million people, but from there we, we are again learning. We need to keep going and go deeper. And so we just uh, did a new initiative on cybersecurity to your point again, Alfie, that that is such a growth sector and we really need to do some targeted skilling um, of individuals for targeted roles and really start to um, bridge the gap 
there. And then, of course, I think you may be going to Chris next, but we we are very, you know, I think grow with Google and all the different opportunities that Google has in the marketplace are also so important. You know, for me, I'm like the more content we can all put out there together, the more that we can act together, the more of a chance that we have to um, not only innovate, but then really take some of those innovative ideas and really scale them um, through through our government partners and, and through our uh different NGO and IGO partners as well. Fantastic. Th thanks for sharing that, Naria. Um, and Chris, um, obviously we're talking here about upskilling, you know, which is very much in, in the area of, of education and learning and traditional educational systems, which are already in place globally, um, aren't necessarily um, taking on board the, the the message or the urgency that we've heard in, in, in a lot of the speakers' um, presentations today and, and discussion today. So how, how do you think that traditional education systems can best incorporate digital skills? And indeed, is there a role for, for digital tech such as Google uh, within the basic education or to support um, educational systems in this? Thank you for the question. And again, like Larry, I, I thank you for having giving me the opportunity to come and present with you and, and speak with you and, and learn from all of you. This has been such an educational opportunity for me, my first time presenting here with the ITU. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I think there's two parts of education that have value. I think there is the traditional education, which is in schools, but I also think there is the non-traditional education. It's 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 the hustle. It's it's the finding the, the the desire to do something. I I myself am a failed musician. I studied opera in university, and didn't have the talent to make it. But I found myself doing technology, and I've changed my career several times mid cycle. And I did all of this on the job because I had a passion for something. I fell in love with something. I I discovered accessibility because my own product wasn't accessible, and I. I wanted to, to make up for the rest of my career where I hadn't made things that were accessible. So I don't want to undervalue um, the hustle that people have when they want to when they want to make something of themselves. I've been doing more and more work in, in on, on the continent and I've learned about the hustlepreneur, which you have this passion to drive and create something and and do what it takes. And I think that's a key factor to the education is you you have an opportunity, you have a desire and, and it's up to the Microsofts and the Googles and the governments of the world to provide the platform and opportunity for them to take this passion and drive and turn it into something new. Coming back to the, the, the traditional educational system, I think one of the most important things you, we need to do, and again, I, I always take an accessibility disability lens, is to ask the questions of the people who are trying to serve. What's working? And more importantly, what's not working? So we can fix those things. We can make sure those things are, 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 are addressed. Are we teaching them in the right language, meta, literally or figuratively? Are we speaking in a way that's resonant to them so they actually hear the message that we're trying to teach? When it comes from a disability perspective, do we actually have materials that allow them to, to take the information we're trying to give? Is, is it accessible? If, 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 if you give me a PowerPoint, the uh, PowerPoint has many wonderful tools to make it make them accessible. Do you have the alt text so the, the, the charts can be seen? Are they color contrast aware? Do your videos have captions or audio description? There's so many small things that we, we need to do with intent to educate, with an intent to inspire. That's how you teach people is you get them excited and then get them the materials that allow them to learn what they want and how they want. I remember looking at when my, my, my son was 12, he told me that YouTube is where he learned how to play video games. And that I learned from there, the magic of video to teach people. And now my daughter is now 13, many years later, she's learning how to cook because of TikTok. So I think we need to reinvent education in a way that is resonant to the people we're trying to teach. It makes data gathering hard, Dorothy, and so I apologize for that part of these things. But I think it's more important that we teach them in the language that they that they speak, it, again, both literally and figuratively. So we, we can't expect traditional systems to meet the needs, so we need to adopt the systems that they're using. And we need to do it in a broad perspective where we understand the needs and the abilities and use digital technology to sort of fix that gap. Is it, is it something, do they need braille displays? 
How do we create braille displays that are affordable on the continent and in, 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 in this in the smaller countries? This is a technology that needs to be invented. And it probably needs to be invented in the country because without that context, without that hustle, you're never gonna create uh, something that is, is resonant. So given the nature of the change of work and school, these digital skills are more important. I mean, Naria has a, the, the work that they've done at Microsoft is, is truly powerful. At Google, we have our grow with Google classes on IT support and data analytics, design and program management. This is a great once you get into the industry. And then because traditional educational systems like, like, like in universities don't always give you what you want, you need these other opportunities to, to get skills and prove that you have them. Um, but I think the most important thing, looking back on, on my experience, is schools should be able to teach people how to use the tools of today. They need to teach them how to learn because the job you're going to have in 20 years from now doesn't exist today. And you need to have people understand how to learn the new way. And that's how you get them educated and employed and in the jobs of tomorrow. No, very, very good. I think it's it's definitely um, like the message there of, of being really relevant to, to the user and to the community, being guided also by the community, um, particularly looking at how young people like to learn, you know, more self-paced, self-directed uh, at a time and a place and through a device of, of your choosing, um, which is not necessarily synced up with how traditional education is working today. Um, and as a parent myself, you know, it does concern me a little bit how little um, time and, and priority is placed on digital skills and things like what Alfie alluded to earlier, particularly around security and privacy and misinformation. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and Chris, I know, I mean, in your area of, of, of accessibility and, and inclusion, um, I think it's important also to look at underlying issues that might need to be resolved, you know, whether that's infrastructure or equipment, content, which has come up uh, several times today already. Um, and of course, you know, even things like literacy or electricity supply. What, what, what are you coming across there in your role at Google that could be of, of uh, value to share with us here today? I, I've, one of the reasons I, I, I've come out here, I've just moved here about three months ago, is because- Here's the UK, is that right? I'm sorry. Here is the UK. Is um, that yes, right? yeah. I I I spent uh, many many years in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I about three months ago I moved here in, to London. And the, one of the key purposes I have is to, to try to understand the needs of people with disabilities across across the continent and and in the Middle East, because you can't take technology invented by people who look like me in Mountain View in California and expect it to work properly in, in Ghana. You can't expect it to work well in, in South Africa because we were not de designing it with people with the constraints, the physical constraints, electricity, Wi-Fi, the power of devices. What technology companies need to do is working hand in hand with the communities, the universities, the startups, the, the researchers, the governments to understand what's working and what's not working. When I first started I, uh, my, my, my statement a moment ago, I talked about you need to ask the questions of, of the people who you're trying to support. Who are we trying to serve? Only then can we understand what's broken. And then when we understand what's broken, then we have a chance to fix it. So from a Google perspective, how do we need to shrink our machine learning models so they'll work on, on the, the Android phones on the continent where they don't have ready access to Wi-Fi and we make it power sensitive so they can use it all day. But until we understand those constraints, we don't know what problems we need to solve. And then we bring it onto the continent, test with people, and we'll fix it because you never get it right the first time. Take it back, fix it again, and eventually we'll get the right answer. But it is really a matter of collaborating with the governments, with the universities, and people on the ground, the people we're trying to serve, get them to tell us what's broken and how we can fix it. Excellent. And empowering, of course, and tapping into local innovation and entrepreneurial or what, what was it you said? Hustlepreneurial. Uh, Hustlepreneur. Yeah, I really like that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move now to um, Valerie and Shergun, who are, of course, part of Generation Connect. 
um, uh, Shergon coming from San Lucia and Valerie from Kenya. Uh, before I do that, I see a lot of um, balls going on in the chat, which is fantastic. Don't forget to drop a question into the Q&A tab. If you have any questions you'd like to put to the panel um, when we come to the end of this particular part of the session, the, the, the round table of panelists. So Shergon, if I may start with you um, in uh, San Lucia, um, you're, you're one of these hustlepreneurs, I think, that, that Chris has, uh, has, has been talking about in terms of you have created your own startup, which is all about um, promoting and, and uh, building capacity around STEM skills to drive the economy in Santa Lucia. So like, I'd, I'd really like to know like, why you're focusing on that and what brought you to focus on that and why is youth capacity development vital to, to the development of, of economies such as San Lucia? Okay, um, first I'd like to start off by just saying I'm truly honored to be part of this wonderful panel and um, a lot of the, the things that persons have been saying have really resonated with me because they have really sparked my interests within this area and really what catalyzed Optronics for me. So starting off by saying why does upskilling the youth matter? It is important for young people to be productive while they are energetic, while they're imaginative and healthy, rather than for them to feel alienated and left without opportunities for personal success. From my perspective, um, digital skills really allowed me to catalyze my both my educational and professional career. And I realized that that was something that was really lacking in, in St. Lucia. And I, I took that, you know, that, that perspective and I, I decided that it was important to, to bring those opportunities to other youth just like myself. And through the programs that I have been able to conduct through my, my business Optronics, we have seen those, that kind of growth in other young people as well. As many people have said, but um, like Dorothy has said, it's very important to make sure that there's a feedback loop between those, those, those programs that are conducted and, you know, actually making sure that the particip participants of those programs uh, benefit from what they are taught. And that's really one of the key aspects of our electronics programs. We make sure that we collect enough information from those programs so that when, you, when we iterate and we, we organize um, for the educational programs that we really target the areas that young people, young people need and are interested in. One of the things that we have also seen after hosting those programs is that it's really important the mode of delivery of those programs. Because as, as Christopher said as well, um, it is what is important to teach young people in a way that they are rece receptive of the, the information that you are trying to bring across. We, we sh I, I feel like in the, the area of um, education, there hasn't been much innovation in, in the way that curriculum has been brought across. While yes, people are changing the content that is being, you know, that is being taught to students, the, the mode of implementation has not really changed. And I, I think there should be more innovation in that aspect because it's, it's really in that area where you, you are able to get students to, to you, you are able to teach them how to learn, as Christopher said, not just teach them, teach them the content, you teach them how to, how to think, how to become critical thinkers. And like, like I said earlier, being able to, you know, become, become a critical thinker is imperative for solving new and innovative problems. Um, just to go on, on further and speak about why it's important, specifically for young people, is because by first training our young people, those positive effects will propagate throughout the society. I mean, this will this will maintain low levels of crime and deviance, increase government tax revenue, and also reduce expenses on both the judicial, penal, and social welfare systems. Um, so, over, so overall, that's that's my my view on that. 
No, yeah, thank you, and I really like the, the the focus as well on the importance of critical thinking, and that's absolutely the case. There was a study done here recently in Ireland, where I'm I'm talking to you from, which was identified exactly the same softer human skill that's that's most needed uh, was critical thinking and and, and communication. Um, can I ask you as well, Sharon, like? Like you, you've been doing this for, for a while now, and like, what are the key constraints preventing greater adoption of technology-based learning within educational institutions? You know, towards younger people and towards towards the betterment of younger people. Okay, so there are some key key capacity constraints, especially in developing countries, that prevent that adoption. In many cases, there are not well-established technology-based curriculum which makes it difficult for teachers to provide those contents. And teachers often themselves lack the technical capacity that is needed to deliver those, that content in an effective classroom manner, which supplements the learning process. Uh, third, world country, third world institutions um, are often lacking the necessary infrastructure in the form of computer labs and fabrication labs as well to facilitate a lot of those, those new and innovative training. Which, which means that students don't have the facilities to partake in those trainings. In addition, the, because of the lack of demand in a lot of these, these smaller, less developed countries, in, in terms of the lack of demand in, in the workforce, those institutions are less, less inclined to offer those um, technology-based training programs because there isn't much demand from it from the, the, the students. Right, and and just before I go on to Valerie, just just quickly, I mean, I think it'd be interesting. Like again, in your experience working with young people, do they feel they have an influence on how programs of learning can can be developed in terms of digital skills? Do they do they feel that they have uh, the ability to tap into partnerships uh, that they have a voice? And, and if not, what can we what can we do to sort of support that? I, I honestly think that oftentimes young people do not feel that they have a voice and that they are not being heard. I think there is a lack of youthful representation on a administrative level um, and on a national level. And I, I think that's something that, that should be focused on the inclusivity of more youth leaders and youth champions in the conversation. Um, but collaboration is very important, in, especially in the technology industry. And I mean, it, it drives a lot of the, the work that is being done today. What I would say to youth just like myself is that you must they must take the opportunity to tap into open source resources that will allow them to, you know, gain access to valuable information. And they need to build a key network of mentors and experts, which will, in, in whatever field that they're going to, which will open those, those doors and opportunities for trainings, workshops, and academic opportunities. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that youth must see technology for what, what it is. It's a tool at the end of the day. And it, what really matters is their creativity and innovation to create a difference. And, uh, yeah. and to, feel, to feel that they can make a difference as well. Uh, I guess, which is really, really important. Thanks a million, Sheridan, and, and really hats off to the amazing work you're doing there in San Lucia. Um, if I may go now to Valerie Waswa in Kenya. Valerie has started up uh, a number of uh, not-for-profit initiatives, grassroots initiatives, uh, particularly aimed at, at, at empowering young women to um, be exposed to and trained in digital skills. Uh, really, some really fantastic works. I'm looking forward very much to, to hearing from Valerie. Valerie, if, if you're there with us, um, uh, I think maybe going back to, to you know, what the minister and also what Dorothy and what Alfie were saying at the beginning, um, how can we have more underrepresented groups such as the women and girls that you're supporting? How can we have them uh, more considered in efforts to upskill uh, in digital skills? Thank you, Paul, for the opportunity and uh, greetings all. Greetings from Kenya. Um, so how we can ensure that we have more women in digital literacy or in the digital economy is by factoring in the unique challenges that these women face. 
So for example, the rural women that we work with in our community, most of them are five years younger than me. So that means they're 15 or 16 or 17 years, but they have two or three children and they have nowhere to leave their kids with. And so we have to allow them to come to the digital hub to access the training with these children, which is something that you get that formal education institutions uh, may not allow. So factoring in a kind of training system that can embody the unique challenges that some of these women face, and uh, this may actually help these women to gain more digital literacy skills. Another challenge is we face is that while training them, in each week, in each day, we have to have at least two or three girls who do not are not able to attain uh, come for the training because of uh, extreme period pains. And so this is a real challenge that most of us do not actually think about when we are coming up with such trainings. And so what we do is that for these days, because at the end of the month, at the end of the week, there are so many days, there are so many things that they have left out on. We always try to come up and uh, with them and recap whatever they had lost during the three or four or five days that they were at home during um, the extreme period pain. So that is one of the ways that we can ensure that these women can access these skills. Another way is actually positive um, discrimination or something I call affirmative action. So for example, our nonprofit organization focuses entirely on women. And this is because this is the only way we can ensure that these opportunities reach as more women as possible. As much as it's discrimination, we are creating opportunities for more and more girls in the rural sectors to be able to access these digital literacy skills. Excellent. And uh, in, in your program, Valerie, um, it'd be great to, to, to hear a little bit about the inspiration behind that and what are the sort of impacts or stories that you're seeing now, success stories, uh, coming out of, of, of these great initiatives that you're doing to uh, empower and upskill uh, young women in, in rural Kenya? Um, thank you, Paul. So but basically, um, this is a project that was inspired by my own personal journey. And I remember back when I was in campus, I come from a, a, a struggling family, I would say. And so I had to be innovative on what more can I do to get an extra income, at least to pay for my own pocket money and to be able to pay for my own rent, which my parents are not able to do. And so that is when I got to learn on more digital skills such as transcription. And through transcription, I actually got to earn an income online. I would work with companies from the US through the Upwork platform. I think most of you know Upwork and Fiverr. And through that, I was able to take myself through university. And so I thought about so many women out there who are not able to access, uh, peri uh, I mean, period products. They're not able to even sustain their young families. And I, it, it gave me a burden to actually start, start this initiative under VPEP called She Goes Digital that can enable girls to earn an income through these digital skills. Because I was exposed to a lot of opportunities that so many of these women actually don't know because you get that they don't even know how to put on a computer. They do not know how to even type. They don't even know English. So we even have to teach them in Swahili. Um, thank God for Google Translator. And so um, that is what actually inspired the story behind this program. And when we talk about the success stories, is that um, uh, we, we get a lot of messages from these girls saying how these skills actually transformed their lives. Uh, some of them, you get their small business owners. Maybe they sell cereals or they sell uh, uh, shoes and kids' clothing. They were able to market their products online, and they are able to get a more customer base. So we have been getting a lot of positive feedback from them, saying how even their sales have gone up, saying how some of them have been able to get jobs in cyber cafes to help. Some of them have been able to start actually cyber cafes in their communities. And so many more uh, uh, success stories that we've had because of the training that we're able to give to them. Paul, you're on mute. Paul, you're muted. 
Beg your pardon. Uh, I was just saying that's so inspiring, Valerie. Really, really great stories. I can really visualize, you know, a young woman setting up a cyber cafe in her village. Must be, it must be an incredible uh, feeling for you as well. And these are stories I think that really need to be shared more widely. Um, that's that's the, the, the like we've heard from all of the different panelists now, and we have a couple of questions that have come in, and I'm just going to throw them out to the panel. To the panel, the first question I have here, um, and these these questions, of course, are coming from from the from those that are attending live today. What role do the speakers feel mobile phones or mobile technology can play in facilitating digital skills training? Any relevant initiatives? they'd like to highlight. Um, maybe if I can put that to, to your, yourself, Valerie, and maybe Do Dorothy as well, or any of the other panelists who would like to, to contribute briefly just on, on terms of how mobile phones or mobile technology can facilitate digital skills training and how important it is. And Alfie has his hand up there as well. Please feel free to, to jump in, Alfie. Sure. So, uh, you know, what I think that any training that we have or is put together has to be mobile first. Mobile right? So first. any format that is made for your online training, you got to make sure it's mobile first. And I think uh, those pro people who provide online training need to think about uh, Netflix, right? Where, yes, I know you, that there's some, some uh, you know, your, your international set organizations say, no, the training has to be online. You've got to take this, uh, you, you do the courseware online in that way you can get the international cert, et cetera. But, but maybe what we need to do is think about how Netflix does it, that you allow the individual to download the content to the phone, go through it. And yes, you want to take the certification, you can go online and do the certification again. So we need to look at how we can adapt our training to be suitable for mobile uh, devices, as well as when you talk about mobile, I mean mobility of training, and that they can take that content wherever they want to go and learn. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Alfie. Uh, yes. I just wanted to say, Paul, that that fits perfectly with an open education resources approach, where uh, your content is licensed in such a way that people can share the content. And yes, you may be worried that People are sharing content and then the, there'll be mushrooming of um, unsupervised training institutions. But if you have your certification sorted out the way Alfie described, I don't think this will impact negatively. And this will allow us to go to scale fast. I totally agree that we have to explore the way mobile phones can support us but I don't believe that every training is suitable for delivery on the mobile phone. I love this micro pulse approach where you put training content in video in one minute intervals, and then people can check and answer questions on the phone. But let's not kid ourselves that training somebody on how to program for supercomputing is going to be effective on the mobile phone soon. So let's blend these approaches, mm -hmm. taking into account that this is lifelong learning. It's a hybrid thing, not just one platform, many platforms. I think that's that's important, the blended approach and the fact that it is lifelong, and particularly in today's world, lifelong learning is absolutely, uh, it's a given um, compared to what would have been a, a generation or so ago. Valerie, did you want to add there about the importance of mobile phones for training in, in your experience? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I would like to say how uh, she goes digital started. We actually used to offer the digital skills training over the phone because you get that it's easier for a girl to afford a smartphone as opposed to a computer or a laptop. And so we used to do the training through the phones. And so basically we used to train them and uh, on skills uh, that are based on the phone. So let's say how to use WhatsApp, how to use social media on their phones, because that is the device that they interact with in their day-to-day -day lives as opposed to a computer, which most of them have never actually owned one. So that is the bit that I wanted to weigh in on. 
Thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, second, and it'll be the final question due to the time limits, uh, but as I said, there's a great conversation going on in the chat. I'm looking forward to, to going over that later. Um, could the panel provide any examples of data visualization projects, that's data visualization projects, or existing frameworks, frameworks related to digital skills that are available? Um, and they give the example of digital equity scorecards. So I'm thinking, Naria, you may have, have inspired that question, but also, Dorothy, you talked about uh, how the world needs a map. So if there's any panelists would like to share any examples of data visualization projects um, related to digital skills that are available for the, for, for the participants to, to check. I did drop in the ILO framework um, <laughs> for 21st century skills, um, but but the visualization piece I, I think would be really fascinating. Um, I have not seen one that is would would be on a kind of global scale. Um, but again, I think this is that one call to action, I think for the private sector and the public together, maybe we can figure out how to harness that energy and, and create that visualization of, of digital. Um, and, and then I also just um, wanted to make a point about the mobile, if I could, <laughs> Paul, um, which is that Dorothy, you're absolutely on point when we definitely found with the skills initiative training with all the different people who went online to learn. Um, that was all well and good, but it wasn't until we actually partnered um, a learner with an NGO that you could see actual high rates of completion of courses. And so I think that's another thing that we need to really be mindful of when we do this digital skilling is that you need to have a pathway set out for you and a guide or a sponsor or somebody that can keep people going um, because it's often um, you know, very easy to stop um, digital skilling when you don't have a, an accountability or anybody um, really pushing you forward and helping you believe that you can you can achieve achieve the path. Th thank you very much, Naria. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time. We're hurtling towards the the end of, of the the pan the allocated time for the panel. But don't forget we have an informal networking session afterwards, which everybody is invited to. Um, some really good questions coming in about universal access and all of that. But unfortunately, we, we won't have time to take it. What I would like to do is is to wrap up, to start to wrap up the panel by inviting all of the panelists uh, starting with uh, the, 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 Her Excellency the Minister, uh, just with a, a key recommendation or a key takeaway you'd like our audience today to go away with, just a very brief soundbite in terms of upskilling for all and how we can achieve this and what is the most critical area we need to focus on. Minister, if I may start with you for a final word. Thank you. Um, we're in this together, but working together, we really can't make a difference in giving uh, all of us the skills that we need to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. It's doable. We just need to focus on it, pool our resources together, government, private sector, NGOs, uh, IGOs, um, working together, and we can get it done. Excellent. Dorothy, may I go to you next? Um, yes, I think that the for me, I like that question about visualization. Let's try and clarify some paths to the actual learning goals we want to achieve. And let's put that within a framework so that we can track our progress to those goals and we can evaluate whether the approaches we are using actually work. Excellent, thank you very much. Naria, may I go to you next? Final takeaway, recommendation. Um, I think it's all been said already. So I'll just say the time to act is now and the moment is now. Um, and, you know, otherwise there will just be rapid acceleration, um, not just of digitalization, but of inequity. And let's close that gap between talent being everywhere and opportunity being not everywhere. I think that's uh, that's something I'll take away today, uh, definitely in terms of the digital uh, skills gap that Dorothy alluded to in her opening keynote remarks. Um, Chris Patno, final uh, word to you in terms of the key recommendation or the key takeaway you'd like the audience to leave with today. The jobs of the future are not necessarily the jobs of today. So how you learn today matters 
more than what you learn in the long run. Thank you very much. Uh, Shergon, your final uh, word and recommendation for the panel today or for the audience today? With this fourth industrial revolution, young persons now more than ever require greater skills to process and evaluate more information. So digital literacy now plays a critical role in the performance or in the workplace as well as in the with the quality of life that those people will experience. Would you go as far as to say it's a life skill? It's a critical life skill? We need to look at it as a critical life skill for the future? Paramount. Paramount in, in the coming future. Paramount. Thank you very much. And Valerie, um, what would be your key recommendation or the takeaway you'd like everybody to go with today? Yes. Uh, so what I would say is that digital skills is a concept that does not uh, exist in a vacuum. So once these uh, uh, underrepresented groups like women have these skills, they need platforms such as digital hubs and training centers and these devices that they can use to continually put these skills into practice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, if I may uh, uh, just attempt to give a very brief summary of everything we've heard today. It genuinely has been a really rich uh, conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to going through the transcript of this. And I think there's been a lot of gems in there um, and also concrete recommendations, which is so important. Um, but as I said, it was a, it was a wide ranging conversation, very rich. Um, so this is not an exhaustive summary by any means, but I think some of the things that, ju that jumped out here were the importance of tracking impact. Um, you know, if you can't measure it, how can you really address it, you know, with, with real conviction um, and with real success? And I think particularly the proposal from Dorothy to, to visualize this, this tracking, you know, through a global map or, or something, something that resonated a lot with both the panelists and, and the audience. Um, I think the, that, as I mentioned earlier, that, that recognizing the fact that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And we need, we need to address that. We need to close that uh, if we're to be really a truly inclusive world and have a, a really truly dynamic and representative and participative uh, global digital economy that has to become really a paramount uh, prerequisite. The importance of youth in all of this uh, goes without saying, but. Do they have a voice? What can we do as policymakers, as leaders, as politicians to really ensure that the voice of youth is there and that the, the skilling and the, the learning and the educational systems are fit for purpose for the, for the youth, for the leaders and industrialists and entrepreneurs, et cetera, of tomorrow. Um, on the issue of open education, I think that's that's something that could require an entire uh, session on its own. But I, th I think the point was made several times that uh, it's so important that these resources are, are being shared, that they're being localized, that content is relevant. Um, and also to, to emphasize what, what Dorothy mentioned there, that learning is a lifelong issue and it, it's, 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 it's a lifelong challenge. It's a lifelong life skill that we all have to get to grips with. Um, and the blended approach is definitely uh, the way to go. And finally, uh, one thing that, that, that sort of hit, hit home with me, particularly when I was listening to Valerie, um, is on the issue of innovation. You know, often we talk about innovation and we think technological innovation, but the, the critical thinking also that Shergon alluded to, but the innovative ways that Valerie is, is, is creating in order to enable people uh, who would normally have no access to, to digital skills training, the innovative ways that she's coming up with to ensure that they have access so that their children can still be looked after, so that they can see the possibility of, of economic improvement is, is really inspiring. And I think some fantastic stories there to, to be shared uh, for sure in the future. Um, so without further ado, we're, we're more or less on time. Um, I'm really, really thankful for everybody for, for joining us today, the incredible panel. I'm very honored to be joined by Her Excellency, the Minister from, from Ghana, to give up your time today and to share the incredible work that you're leading in Ghana, as well as all of our other illustrious panelists. Thank you so much.